Before I do that, I, I want to mention that w we have an email confirming receipt of the sexual orientation and employment book that was at tab 10 from council. And with respect to the money, myths, and change book at tab 9, they designated that book on their exhibit list too, so they, they plainly had it and are aware of it. So. Mr. Uh, Detmar? I have is that I don't believe Professor Herrick has really laid a foundation for the admission of those documents, and Professor Badgett was here, and obviously that was an ideal opportunity to question her about those, those books. Well, tell me, is there an objection to the admission of these exhibits? Um, I, on that same basis, Your Honor, we, we do object to the, to the admission of these two books. Lack of foundation. Lack of foundation by this witness, and also the opportunity with the actual author of the books to to put the books into evidence. Your Honor, this. What, what do you need from the books, you, Mr. Nielsen, that is not contained in these excerpts? The main thing I'm interested in is are, are the things that are contained in the excerpts. What's that? That mainly I am interested in the excerpts, Your Honor. Then why don't we simply admit the excerpts? All right. To, to clarify, Your Honor, so the excerpts are in? Yes. Okay, thank you. All right. Now, Professor Herrick, could you please turn to tab 11 and uh, in the witness binder? And, and this is, you'll find a document pre-marked DIX 1108. Can you identify that document? Uh, the title of it is Best Practices for Asking Questions About Sexual Orientation on Surveys. Thank you. And, Your Honor, this has been admitted, and uh, we did cross-examine Professor Badgett about it. But I, I, So I won't spend much time on it, but I do want to ask you one question about it, Professor Herrick. On, please turn to page 28. And uh, under measurement, there's a heading uh, that you'll see that says measurement. Yes. And it says differences in relationships and sexual practices around the world call into question the cross-cultural equivalence of sexual orientation as a social construct, independent of how the construct is operationalized or how well items intended to measure the construct have been linguistically translated. Do you agree with that observation? Well, I would say that, that that is generally an accurate observation about most constructs that we ask about in survey research. You always want to be aware that uh, there are cultural differences in how different concepts and different terms are understood, apart from simply the language, you know, differences in language, but, but the meaning behind the terms as well. And so that certainly uh, fits well with the construct of sexual orientation as well as many others. All right, but you specifically agree that it fits well with the concept of sexual orientation? Yes. Okay, thank you operationalized, and I see that uh, that term is used in the excerpt that you've just read. What does it mean in lay terms? Well, Your Honor, um, when we approach a research project, we think in terms of variables, phenomena that somehow can change. And we usually start with a theoretical definition of the variable, the ideal definition, the sort of definition you see in a dictionary. But then comes the hard part, which is how do you actually measure that variable? How do you put it into operational terms? So uh, one might have a, a, a general uh, definition for what socioeconomic status means in a textbook sense. But when you actually get to a survey question, you can't say, what's your socioeconomic status? You have to figure out a way to ask the question of the individuals. For example, what was your household income during the last year? And then that answer is used uh, as the operational definition of socioeconomic status for that, that study. So when we operationalize something, it, it means that we are putting it into measurable terms, and we're defining how we're going to measure it in a particular study. There it is characterize that as a proxy for some variable? Uh, yes, uh, because the, the idea would be that 
you're always going to be missing something from the theoretical definition. Uh, at least, I, maybe I could come up with an example where you didn't, but, but typically, yeah, it is, it is going to be a proxy for uh, the theoretical variable. And, of course, some operationalizations are better than others, meaning they get closer to that theoretical definition. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, Professor Herrick, could you please turn to page 12 in the witness binder, or tab 12, excuse me. You'll see a document pre-marked DIX 1249. Can you identify this document? This is a paper called Sampling Lesbian, Gay, and Bisexual Populations, uh, published in the Journal of Counseling Psychology in 2009, authored by uh, Ilan Meyer and Patrick Wilson. Thank you. And, and Your Honor, I believe this document has already been admitted into evidence. Uh, are you familiar with this document? Um, I'm reasonably certain I've read this paper. I haven't read it recently, but I'm, I'm pretty sure I read it. And, and you're familiar with Professor Meyer, of course, correct? I'm, I'm, prof I'm familiar with Professor Meyer and his work, yes. Yes, and he's, he's one of the plaintiff's experts in this case, correct? I believe so. Yes. All right, thank you. On, on page 24, and I, I'm using the internal pagination of the article, there's a, it, the t first full paragraph, and starting with the second sentence, it reads, researchers have distinguished among sexual identity, sexual behavior, and attraction, and we've discussed that, and, and going on. Although these overlap, that is, a person who is attracted to same-sex individuals may also have sex with same-sex individuals, this overlap is not great. Only among 15% of women and 24% of men do the three categories overlap. Have you seen those statistics before? Well, those statistics are drawn from the Lauman study that I was describing earlier. And uh, as I said, what they found was that there was a core group, and it was typically the people who said that they were lesbian or gay or bisexual for whom these three categories did overlap substantially. However, there were uh, many individuals who said, uh, well, they were categorized as having some sort of same-sex attraction, and that was based either on their response to a question about whether they were physically or sexually attracted to people of the same sex, or if they even said that they found the idea of sex with another person of the same sex at least somewhat appealing they were put into the category of having some same-sex desire. And those individuals, it turns out, um, were among the largest group in this minority that wasn't heterosexual uh, and wasn't exclusively lesbian, gay, or bisexual. Uh, it, it was those individuals uh, who said they had the, some attraction or, or found this idea somewhat appealing. Um, and then there were other individuals who said that they had engaged in behavior with someone of the same sex but uh, were not themselves lesbian, gay, or bisexual, or, and in some cases, didn't even say that they had attractions. So that's where these numbers come from. So you are familiar with the numbers? Yes. And do you believe Professor Meyer has accurately portrayed them here? Well, you know, I, uh, I always have trouble remembering the specific percentages, but I'm certainly willing to assume that he's uh, stated them accurately here. All right, thank you. Now, now continuing on, it reads, even within these categories, varied groups can be identified. Identity labels, and even whether a person uses an LGB identity label at all, vary across generations, racial ethnic groups, geographical regions, education levels, and other group characteristics. Do you agree that identity level labels for sexual orientation vary in this manner? Um, you know, I'm honestly not sure exactly what he means when he says identity labels vary. Uh, I, I am aware in the, the parenthetical clause there that says, even whether a person uses an LGB identity label at all, um, that we certainly have seen uh, differences there across racial and ethnic groups. Uh, for example, in my, uh, one of the studies I was talking about earlier, which showed that you know, 95% of gay men said that they don't experience a choice about their sexual orientation. That study was based on a nationally representative sample of lesbian, gay, and bisexual adults. And one of the patterns that I observed in those data was that the, bi the category of bisexual men, self-described bisexual men, was much more likely to include uh, Hispanic and non-Hispanic 
blacks than were the categories of gay men, lesbian, or bisexual women. So we certainly do see variations across racial and ethnic groups. Um, I'm not exactly certain what he, what, how you interpret the, the statement without that parenthetical clause to just say identity labels vary, unless, of course, he means something along the lines of what I was referring to earlier. He says across generations, maybe what he means there uh, is, for example, that uh, use of a word like queer as a self-descriptor is more common among younger individuals than among older individuals. Um, I'm, not, I'm honestly, though, not quite sure about the... Uh, the reference to geographical regions and other group characteristics. So uh, I, I would assume, and, and again, I haven't read this paper recently, perhaps he lays that out in greater detail at another point in the paper, uh, but I'm not honestly sure just taking this sentence out of context to exactly what he means by that. All right, thank you. Now, now continuing on, Professor Meyer states, behavioral definitions which rely on seemingly objective and clear criteria often asked is, have you had sexual relationships with men, women, or both men and women? Also vary. For example, researchers have referred to different time periods for assessing sexuality, past year, past five years, since age 18, and ever. Because more people have had same-sex sex in adolescence, defining sexual orientation as sexual behavior ever includes more people than defining it as past year. This can lead to significantly different estimates. Lauman et al. found that 42% of all men who had ever had same-sex contact had none after age 18. Do you agree that behavioral definitions of sexual orientation can vary in this manner? You know, I teach a course on survey and questionnaire methodology, and this is something I always explain to my students, that whenever you're asking about past behaviors, you absolutely have to specify the time period in which you're asking about any behavior uh, that is something that might be repeated is going to be more likely to uh, have occurred in a, if you, I'm sorry, if you specify a broader range of time, you're going to get a higher level of that behavior. So if you ask people, have you done such and such in the past year, and you also ask them, have you done such and such in the past 20 years, or how often, you're likely to get a higher number if you ask about 20 years than if you ask about one year. All right, thank you. Now, please turn to uh, tab 13 in the witness binder, if you would, sir. You'll find a document pre-marked DIX 1248. And I apologize, Professor Herrick, the exhibit appears to be missing a, its title page, but... Yeah. I'll represent to you that this is a copy of an article entitled Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, and Transgender Health, Findings and Concerns, written by a group of scholars including Laura Dean, Elon Meyer, and published in the Journal of Gay and Lesbian Medical Association in 2000. And, and Your Honor, this uh, DIX-48 has already been admitted. But uh, are you familiar with this article? Um, I'm honestly not sure if I've seen this article before. Are you familiar with Laura Dean? I know Laura Dean, and I know some of her research. All right, thank you. And you're familiar with Professor Miller, correct? Professor who? Meyer. Meyer? Uh, yes. Thank you. All right, please look at page 102. In the second paragraph, the second sentence reads, the degree to which sexual orientation or gender identity is central to one's self-definition, the level of affiliation with other LGBT people, and the rejection of or acceptance of societal stereotypes and prejudice vary greatly among individuals. Do you agree that the degree to which sexual orientation is central to one's self-definition varies greatly among individuals? I'm just trying to catch up with you here. The, the question is, uh, do you agree that the degree to which sexual orientation is central to one's self-definition varies greatly among individuals? I would say that yes, in the context of this sentence, in the same way that um, rejection or acceptance of stereotypes and prejudice also varies greatly, I would say that all of those things do show variability from one individual to another. All right, thank you. And on the same page, it, underneath the next heading, 
It says, lesbian, gay, and bisexual, LGB people are defined by their sexual orientation. I'm, I'm sorry, where are we? It's the same page, same oh, okay. column. Same page. It's under lesbian, gay, and bisexual populations, oh. that next paragraph. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, do you see that, sir? Okay. Lesbian, gay, and bisexual, parentheses, LGB, people are defined by their sexual orientation, a definition that is complex and variable. Throughout history and among cultures, the definition of sexual orientation shifts and changes. Do you agree that the definition of sexual orientation is complex and variable? Well, I think we've been discussing the fact that it's complex and variable here, I think, is making the point that I made earlier that, for example, it seemed as though the emergence of, of some of the categories of homosexual and heterosexual are evident in the medical literature uh, only since the 19th century. So I assume that that's what they're meaning, that when they say throughout history and among cultures, the definition of sexual orientation shifts and changes. All right, thank you. And, and do you agree that throughout history and among cultures, the definition does shift and change? I would say that it has uh, changed. Uh, has cha has yeah. shifted, has changed? Yes. Okay, thank you. And... <clears throat> ...generally accepted definition of an LGB person is one with an orientation toward people of the same gender and sexual behavior, affection, or attraction, and or self-identity as gay, lesbian, or bisexual, just as a matter of completeness, Your Honor. Your, Your Honor, I, I believe comments of that sort would be better reserved for uh, redirect. I agree. <laughs> All right. Please turn to page 135. Page, I'm sorry. 135. Again, I'm using the internal pagination yeah, yeah. of the article. And uh, I'm going to start with the second sentence in the paragraph under defining the populations. Do you see that, Professor Herrick? Yes. It says, in fact, many different terms were used to label sexual orientations before the terms heterosexual, homosexual, bisexual, gay, and lesbian slowly came into widespread use from the 1920s through the 1960s. Do you agree with that? That there were different terms. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, yes. I, I think actually, um, when they say widespread use, I assume that they mean in common parlance. The term homosexual and and uh, well, the term homosexual, I believe, started to appear in medical literature in the late 1800s, and heterosexual followed soon after that. Um, gay and lesbian, as terms to describe lesbians and gay men, are. Uh, more recent uh, and have become popular in, in the general culture, I think, really since the 1960s. Um, so, and, and prior to that, there were other terms that were used to describe um, these phenomena of sexual orientation. All right, thank you. And they go on to write, the authors go on to write in the next sentence, unfortunately, there is still no general consensus on the definition of these terms although each includes components of at least one of three dimensions. One, sexual orientation, identity. Two, sexual behavior. And or three, sexual attraction. Now, we've discussed those three dimensions, but do you agree with Professor Meyer and Professor Dean's statement that there is, quote, still no general consensus, close quote, on the meaning of those terms, which would include homosexual, gay, and lesbian? Well, I'm not exactly sure what they mean by uh, consensus, but I, I think that what they're getting at is that these terms are used in different ways depending upon the, and we're talking about researchers here, uh, depending upon the study. So, for example, well, in fact, uh, continuing the paragraph, they say, for example, one study might define sexual orientation as a form of identity, as self-identified heterosexual, homosexual, bisexual, gay, or lesbian while another defines it as a gender choice in sexual partners, and yet another as the gender of those to whom one is sexually attracted. So what they're saying is some studies might define it in terms of identity, some in terms of attraction, some in terms of uh, behavior. Um, in, in that sense, you know, as I think we've been saying, 
researchers end up using different operational definitions of the term depending upon their research needs and depending sometimes on the data set. So I, I'm, I don't know that I would phrase it as saying there's no consensus. I, I think there is consensus that these are the different ways that we use these terms. Um, it's just that depending upon the research needs, you sometimes define it one way, say in terms of behavior. Other times you define it in terms of identification. Other times in terms of patterns of attraction. Now, do you believe that, now you said you wouldn't say it that way, but do you believe that the statement there is still no general consensus on the definition of these terms is an unreasonable statement? Well, if by consensus they mean that there is no single definition that is always used by all researchers, if that's what they mean by no consensus, then I would uh, agree with that. I would say if, if, what, if, if we're interpreting that to mean that there's no agreement that these three dimensions are the main ones of sexual orientation, then I would disagree with that. Which, this, of course, makes me tend to le think that what they mean is uh, that people use these terms in different ways depending upon the research context rather than having one single definition that is always used throughout all research studies. So you believe that if they used it in the sense, second sense, that would be unreasonable? I think I just said that. You said you that, disagreed with it. I'm asking you, would it, that you think that would be unreasonable? Well, by the second sense, I, <laughs> I may be forgetting which was the second sense. I, I thought that the idea that different researchers define it differently depending upon the study, and if that's what they mean by there not being consensus, then of course that, that's accurate. The um, other one. The other, the other one you said, if they mean it, 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 that there's a single definition that is used uniformly by all researchers in every situation, um, uh, and that that's how the term is always, uh, that's how the construct is always operationalized. I would say there is, there is not that sort of consensus. All right, and uh, you believe if they use the term more broadly, just to mean that there is no general consensus, without the qualifications you gave, that it would be an unreasonable statement. Well, I've got to admit I'm a little bit lost. Um, I think it would be a reasonable statement to say that there is no one definition that is always used consistently in every research study by every researcher. And so if that's the meaning of there is no consensus, then I would agree with that and say that that's an accurate statement. If they mean, and I think this is probably not what they mean, uh, to say that, um, well, now I'm getting lost myself. Um, as I've been saying, the term is defined differently in different research studies depending upon the operational uh, needs of the, of the study. Um, and if that's what they mean by there being, uh, well, I don't, I don't think that's what they meant. I, I just can't imagine that that's what they were thinking of here. All right, let, let's move on to the next, uh, skip a paragraph to uh, the paragraph that starts recent national studies. It's, we're still on the same page. And it says, quote, recent national studies estimating the percentage of the population that falls into each of the three broad dimensions of identity, behavior, and attraction show that 1 to 4 percent of the population identifies as lesbian or gay. 2 to 6 percent of the population reports some same-sex behavior in the previous five years. And up to 21 percent of the population reports same-sex attraction at least once in adulthood. And then there's a series of citations. Therefore, depending upon how it is defined and measured, 1 to 21 percent of the population could be classified as lesbian or gay to some degree, with the remainder classified as bisexual or heterosexual to some degree. Are you, are you familiar with those statistics, Professor Herrick? Um, well, I'm, I think I'm generally familiar with the studies that they're citing here. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I haven't reviewed most of them lately, but I, I think I'm familiar with these studies. And, and you, but you believe those statistics are fully consistent with the opinions you've offered in this case, correct? Uh, yes, that in fact what we see is that if you simply ask about uh, same-sex attraction or if simply the idea that someone might find uh, an interaction, a sexual interaction with someone of the same sex at least somewhat appealing, you do get a very broad uh, you get a large number of people saying that who would not necessarily also say that they have engaged in same-sex behavior or identify as lesbian, gay, or bisexual. So, yes, I would say that, that those numbers uh, uh, probably are accurate. All right, thank you. And, and please turn to the next page, 136.
and I, I want you to look at the first full paragraph on that page. And the authors have switched, as you'll see, it, looking at the back page, from defining the populations to measuring the populations. Mm -hmm. Yes. And they say, existing measures of sexual orientation range in complexity from simple dichotomous measures in which subjects report that they are or are not heterosexual or homosexual to more complex scales as developed by Kinsey, and I'll skip the apparatus, Klein, Shively, DiCecco, and Sell. There exists no consensus and virtually no literature discussing when and where each of these measures should be used. Do you agree that existing measures of sexual orientation vary in this manner? Well, it only makes sense that if you're defining sexual orientation in terms of attraction, you are going to measure it differently than if you define it in terms of one's sexual behavior history. So, yes, it is the case that there are a variety of different measures. And I believe that actually the document that you, uh, I, that we were looking at earlier, the one about the best practices, uh, contained recommendations for survey researchers on uh, the best ways to ask questions about those different facets of sexual orientation. Yes, it, uh, I believe that's correct. Now, it says, there exists no consensus and virtually no literature discussing when and where each of these measures should be used. Do you agree with that? Well, there's that word consensus again. Um, I, I'm not sure what they mean by that. Um, I would say that there certainly is variability in how researchers have measured sexual orientation and that um, a study might very well be criticized on the grounds that the measure of sexual orientation that they used was not the best one for the purposes of their research study. And so in that sense, I guess you can say that there would not be consensus um, on when and where each of these measures should be used. Um, and I would say also that I, I don't know that there's virtually no research literature, um, but there certainly has not been an extensive research literature on the various strategies, you know, specifically discussing the various strategies uh, all in comparison with each other. Certainly these different references that they're citing are all instances where researchers were developing ways of measuring sexual orientation. And if we go back to that earlier paragraph where they were citing the national studies that came up with these different percentages, certainly all of those researchers discussed at some point um, how they measured sexual orientation. Um, so I think what they must be referring to is literature that somehow is putting all of these different measures side by side and comparing them. And uh, perhaps there's not an extensive literature in that regard, although I believe that Dr. Sell, who is cited here, has published several papers on that topic. All right. Thank you. Please turn to tab 14 in the witness binder. You'll find a document pre-marked DIX 1235. Can you identify this document? This is an article by uh, Letitia Ann Peplau and Linda Garnett's titled, A New Paradigm for Understanding Women's Sexuality and Sexual Orientation, which was published in the Journal of Social Issues in 2000. Thank you. Are you familiar with this article? Yes. And you're, you're familiar with Professor Peplau, correct? Yes. And she's one of the plaintiff's experts in this case, correct? My understanding. Yes, thank you. Your Honor, I would like to offer Exhibit DIX 1235 into evidence. Your Honor, again, we would just object to the extent that Professor Peplau was here to answer questions about this article when she's on the stand. Well, let's see where this goes. I think probably <coughs> uh, do we have some questions about some of the comments. I, I, I do. The, uh, admit the. Uh, I do. We can read the letter or the uh, the article and. Uh, Thank you. I. The reason we're using these documents with Professor Herrick rather than Professor Peplau is that they go to the topics of his uh, testimony. It doesn't quite pose the same problem as admitting whole books. All right. Thank you. Uh, on pay, please turn to page uh, 342, if you would, Professor Herrick. I see a table, table one. 
and the table is entitled Comparing Old and New Paradigms for Conceptualizing Women's Sexual Orientation. And on the one side, you'll see old perspectives. On the new side, new, on the right side, new perspectives. And at the second one from the bottom, the authors, you'll see that the authors uh, label it as the old perspective, or, and old and, or the old, yeah, the old perspective. S sexual identity, attractions, and behavior form discrete categories, i.e., heterosexual, homosexual, bisexual. And then as the new perspective, sexual identity, attractions, and behavior can be varied, complex, and inconsistent. Do you agree with the new perspective, Professor Herrick? Well, I think that what Professor Peplau is doing here is pointing out that um, just as the old perspective was that homosexuals are um, uh, abnormal and psychologically impaired um, and, and gender nonconforming, and that, that's really something we know is no longer the case. I think that what she's pointing out here is that data such as that from the Laumann study and others show that, in fact, there are individuals, uh, even though they may be uh, a relative minority of individuals, there are individuals for whom uh, their behavioral histories, their attractions, and their identities don't match up perfectly. Right, thank you. And if you could please turn back to three, page 337. And uh, in the third paragraph on that page, she writes in the middle of that paragraph, more broadly, the phenomena of sexual orientation are not fixed and universal, but rather highly variable across time and place. Do you agree with that statement, Professor Herrick? Well, in the context in which she's saying it, which is pointing to cross-cultural and historical studies, meaning that if we're looking at all human beings throughout all time, it would be a mistake to say that the experiences of contemporary women are universal, that they apply to all women at all historical eras and across all cultures. And so certainly, and I, I would, although this article focuses on women, I would say the same is true of men's experiences, that you cannot generalize across all cultures and all historical eras from our experiences in contemporary American society. And I believe that, that that's what she says in this uh, sentence here. All right, and, and please turn to page 344, and you'll see a heading titled Multiple Pathways when you get there. Do you, do you see that, Professor Eric? Yes. Okay, in the paragraph under that, in the, the last full sentence on the page that starts in contemporary, in contemporary society, a woman's assertion that she is heterosexual or lesbian may be based on quite diverse and nonlinear developmental trajectories. Women may be drawn to a particular lifestyle for differing reasons. Knowing that a woman labels herself as heterosexual, lesbian, or bisexual does not necessarily inform us about the pattern of her life experiences or the nature of her current erotic thoughts and feelings. Do you disagree with any of those statements? Well, I think that what Professor Peplau and, and Dr. Garnett are talking about here is the idea that um, it has often been assumed by people who try to understand the etiology or the origins of sexual orientation that there's simply going to be a single explanation that's going to apply to everyone. And I believe that what she's suggesting here is that, in fact, it's more likely to be the case that people arrive at their adult sexual orientation through different pathways. And so simply because you know that a particular woman uh, is heterosexual doesn't necessarily tell you what her developmental history was uh, any more than knowing that she's lesbian or bisexual, that there may be, in fact, a variety of different experiences and perhaps even biological factors that work differently in different individuals. And so there is no single pathway to adult sexual orientation. Uh, it may very well be the case that there are multiple pathways. All right, thank you. And, and what about the last part where she says, knowing that a woman labels herself as heterosexual, lesbian, or bisexual does not necessarily inform us about the pattern of her life experiences or the nature of her current erotic thoughts and feelings. And what you just said, I think, focuses more on the pattern of her life experiences, perhaps. But what about the last part? Do you agree that 
knowing that a woman labels herself as heterosexual, lesbian, or bisexual does not necessarily inform us of the nature of her current erotic thoughts and feelings? Well, again, you know, using the example of the Lauman study, what we see there is that although most people who labeled themselves heterosexual also described different sex attractions or said they had different sex attractions, and most people who labeled themselves lesbian, gay, or bisexual uh, said that they had same-sex attractions, there were some people for whom that was not the case. So there were some people who labeled themselves heterosexual and yet said that they had some same-sex attractions. And so I believe that that's the sort of point that she's making here, that you can't assume that because one identifies with a particular label that that necessarily tells you everything about their sexual attractions or their sexual behavior experience. We know that it does in most cases, but not in every case. Do you uh, agree with her statement, then? I agree with what I just said, and I think that the, I think that. Uh, do, you, uh, do you agree that knowing that a woman labels herself as heterosexual, lesbian, or bisexual does not necessarily inform us of the nature of her current erotic thoughts and feelings? I yeah, in the context of what I just said, I would say it does not necessarily inform us about the her current attractions and behaviors as well. All right, thank you. Now, Your Honor, I, I think we've laid more than ample foundation for this, and I'd like to move this exhibit into, ad, into evidence. That's DIX 1235? Correct. Very well. Please turn to, uh, please turn to tab 15 in the witness binder, if you would, Professor Herrick. You'll find here a document pre-marked DIX 1239. And Professor Herrick, can you identify this document? Well, um, I can identify the title. I'm not sure of exactly where it's from. It's called The Development of Sexual Orientation in Women. Uh, the authors are Letitia Ann Peplau, Leah Spaulding, Terry Conley, and Rosemary Veniegas. Um, I believe this was published in a an edited volume, but I'm not absolutely certain about that. Are, are and it's not marked on the exhibit. Thank you. And are you familiar with this document? Well, I believe I've I've read it. I have I don't I know I haven't read it recently, but I believe I have read it at some point in the past. Can you tell me where it's from? That would actually help to refresh my memory. I, I'm not certain at the moment as I stand here without double checking. Is it from a journal or an edited book, do you know? Uh, I believe the answer to that question is yes, but I, if you're asking me which, I don't know. I meant which. Uh, <laughs> which one? Now the, the I don't want to sustain a compounded question. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but, uh, well, that's an that question. <laughs> yes, and I, I don't think I'm allowed to object to his questions. Um, Plaintiffs have indicated that they don't have an objection to the authenticity of this, and uh, you are familiar with Professor Peplau, correct? Correct. And you believe you're familiar with this work? I believe I've seen it before, yes. Okay, please turn to page 83, if you would. Okay. The author writes, yet there is well, in page 83, it's around the middle of the page. It's the first uh, sentence of the paragraph, second paragraph under the heading there. Yes. It says, yet there is ample documentation that same-sex attractions and behaviors are not inevitably or inherently linked to one's identity. Do you agree that same-sex attractions and behaviors are not inevitably linked to one's identity? Well, I, I think that what they say in the next sentence is the example of romantic friendships between women in the 18th and 19th centuries that were considered to be socially acceptable but did not have an implication for a woman being identified as a lesbian or a homosexual. Uh, so certainly in that context, uh, I think that that's an accurate statement. But well, what about generally? Do you believe that there is ample documentation that same-sex attractions and behaviors are not inevitably linked to one's identity? Well, without the benefit of reading the entire uh, uh, article again to, to know the exact contents, um, I, I would say that I've already said that, that in some cases 
uh, a person's attractions don't match their identity label. Sometimes a person's behaviors don't match their identity label. Um, I, I do think, just from being able to scan this, I think they're specifically talking about uh, historical research. Um, but, but I, you know, certainly would go back to what I've already said about the idea that sometimes there are individuals whose uh, identity label is not uh, completely predictive of their behavior or some of their attractions. So, so you shouldn't have any. So you do agree that there's no inevitable link, I gather. But what, what about the second half, though? That there's no inherent link. Do you agree with that? Well, could you? Uh, I, I'm honestly not sure what they mean by an inherent link here. So uh, I'd have a problem with that. Um, I, I, I'll go back to how I've said it before without using the word inherent because I'm honestly just not quite sure what they mean here by that. But um, it is the case that for most people there is a relationship, a, a close relationship, but for some people there is not. And so if that means there's not an inherent link because there are exceptions, then, then I would agree with that term uh, if that's what they mean by it. But you think stated broadly, if somebody were state, to state more generally that same-sex attractions and behaviors are not inherently linked to one's identity. Do you believe that would be an unreasonable statement? Well, I would just want to know what they meant by inherently. And depending on their meaning, you think that might be an unreasonable statement? I would just want to know what they mean by inherently. As I said, um, I think if you're a betting person and a person tells you that they're heterosexual, the safe bet would be that their attractions are to people of the other sex. But it is possible that they might say that they have same-sex attractions as well, or even more. But, um, but so if, if what we mean by inherent is that there's absolutely no overlap. There is never a heterosexual person who, uh, in order for it not to, in order for it to be inherent, it would have to be the case that all heterosexuals report exclusively different sex attractions and exclusively different sex behavior. And the flip side of that for lesbians and gay men. Then I would say that um, no, you wouldn't. You wouldn't say there's there's an inherent link between those things. All right, thank you. And, and your honor, I'd like to move DIX 1239 into evidence. Your honor, uh, we just renewed the same objection about uh, the author not being here. Understanding your position. Well, I understand uh, 1239 is admitted. Thank you, your honor. All right. And take me to the uh, page from which you were quoting in 1239? Yes, Your Honor. It 85? It was page 87 that we were quoting from, Your Honor. Oh, it was page 83. Did I misspeak? I, I, let I was looking at page 83. Give me just one moment. to. It is page 83, Your Honor. I, I did misspeak there. And, th and thank you, Professor Eric, for catching that. Getting at what point? It was in the middle of the page, around, it's a paragraph, um, the second full paragraph on the page, Your Honor. No, under the, the next one below that, yet there. All right, fine. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Uh, Professor Harris, could you please turn to tab 16 in your witness binder? And you'll find a document pre-marked DIX 978. And uh, can you identify this document, Professor Herrick? Well, it's a photocopy of the cover of the book describing the Lauman study that we've been referring to. Uh, the title of the book was The Social Organization of Sexuality, subtitle Sexual Practices in the United States. And um, paging ahead, it looks as though it's chapter eight from that book, which was the chapter on homosexuality. Correct, and, and chapter eight is reproduced in full here. And uh, I, I believe, Your Honor, that uh, ex this exhibit 978, DIX 978, is already in evidence. I believe that's correct. It, it is. I believe it's. I believe that's correct. That this is one that both sides designated and. Honestly, I don't know which one it came in as, but it's... Send it in. Yes. Thank you, Your Honor. Right. Now, 
You're familiar with this document, correct? Yes, I am. And you uh, relied on it informing your expert opinions, correct? Um, well, yeah, I relied on, on some of the data from this. Yes, and you, in fact, you cited it in your report. Yes. And, and this, this study, the Lauman study, if, if I may call it that, it's widely considered to be a very high quality national survey with a large probability sample of sexuality, correct? Um, yes, I, I was only hesitating over large because I'm forgetting the exact sample size, but it is, it was a, uh, it is a respected national survey on sexuality. Right, and if, do you believe that it was not a large probability sample? Well, large is a relative term. I was just trying to remember the, the I'm, re I'm remembering that it was somewhere in the neighborhood of a couple thousand people or maybe 3,200 people, something like that. And yeah, that, that's a good size sample. All right, thank you. And, and in fact, no national study in the United States with a large probability sample has addressed questions of sexuality in the way that the Lauman study did. It was a very comprehensive survey and is still considered the authoritative source for data at this point, correct? I, I believe I wrote those words. You said them in your deposition, sir. <laughs> uh, yes, that's correct. All right. And please look at page 290. Okay. Around the middle of the page, right underneath the, the 8.3 sub subheading, it says, to quantify or count something requires unambiguous definition of the phenomenon in question, and we lack this in speaking homosexuality. Do you agree that we lack an unambiguous definition of homosexuality? Well, here what they're talking about is an operational definition. They're saying to quantify or count something requires an unambiguous definition. And I think what they were getting at and what they're leading up to is that um, sometimes people might use identity as the as a basis for their operational definition. Sometimes they might use attraction. Sometimes they might use one's sexual behavior history. And so that creates problems when one is trying to count how many people fit into these different categories. And do you believe that if you pick one of those definitions, attraction, be behavior, or identity, at that point you have an unambiguous definition, Professor Eric? Well, if you pick it and you specify it and it's not ambiguous, then you have an unambiguous definition. Well, that's tautological, isn't it, sir? Yes, it is. But is uh, just saying I'm going to pick attraction, at that point it's still ambiguous, correct? I think what they're saying is if you say we're going to measure homosexuality and heterosexuality, that's where the ambiguity is, and that you have to specify exactly what it is that you're measuring. So if you say you're going to measure homosexuality and heterosexuality in the American population, uh, what these researchers did was to look at behavior and attraction and identity. Uh, and they explain in great detail how they ask those questions uh, and they report their data accordingly. So I think what, where they're saying the ambiguity emerges is if you use these broad terms like homosexuality or heterosexuality uh, without specifying exactly what it is that you're measuring. Right, and, and let's just go back to exactly what they wrote, okay. which is as opposed to what they may have or may not have meant, which is to quantify or count something requires unambiguous definition of the phenomenon in question, and we lack this in speaking of homosexuality. Do you agree that we lack an unambiguous definition of homosexuality? Well, Certainly in terms of, of doing what they say they're doing, to quantify or count, you can't just say homosexuality. That would be an ambiguous term. There would not be a single operational definition for that. What about unoperational? Just Do you think there's a single definition for homosexuality? Well, as I said earlier, uh, or you can derive from what I said earlier, homosexuality can be understood as an ongoing, enduring pattern of attraction and desire or uh, romantic attraction, sexual attraction or desire for people of the same sex. It can be defined as an ongoing pattern of sexual behavior with people of the same sex. It can be defined as an identification of oneself as gay or lesbian or belonging to the gay or lesbian community. Uh, so I would say there you have a definition of homosexuality that is not ambiguous. It sounded like three definitions, Professor Eric. Is Well, again, the, I think that that encompasses the phenomenon. Um, 
what they show in this in this report is that for most people who say they are gay, lesbian, or bisexuality, the three definitions coincide. But let's actually turn to page 299, uh, if you would. And uh, there are two Venn diagrams, one for women and one for men. And uh, I'd actually like to put these up on the screen if I could. I'll wait a moment until that happens. The figures on page 299. Okay, and if you could, can we zoom in on those a little bit? All right, yes, for, for women. Now you'll see it has, uh, that this diagram indicates a circle for desire, a circle for behavior, and a circle for identity. And uh, it indicates that for women, same-sex desire, behavior, and identity overlap only 15% of the individuals studied, correct? Well, what it shows is that for the women who said that they had a lesbian or bisexual identity, all of them also said that they had same-sex desire, and all but one said that they also had same-sex sexual behavior. All right, and it also shows that of the women who had same-sex desire, 59% had neither same-sex identity or same-sex behavior, correct? Right, and as I said earlier, these included women who simply said that they found the idea of possibly having sex with someone of the same sex at least somewhat appealing. So this is a very broad, inclusive sort of definition of attraction, which I believe that the authors of the book explain in some detail. All right, and it also finds that 13% of the women who had desire engaged in same-sex behavior but did not have same-sex identity, correct? No, it's not 13% of the women who had desire. It's 13% of the entire group of women the, who were represented samples, in this diagram. That's the sample size, correct. I apologize for that. It's 19 women, basically. So 13% of the sample had... No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. 13% of the sample of the women had same-sex desire and same-sex behavior, but not same-sex identity, correct? 13% of this subsample, not of the entire survey sample, but of the um, 150 women who are diagrammed here, yes. So 19 of those women, that's where I sometimes find it easier to just use the numbers rather than the percentages, but 19 of those women said that they experienced same-sex desire and had engaged in uh, beha sexual behavior with another woman, but did not identify themselves as being lesbian or bisexual. All right, as opposed to the 23 women who had all three, correct, if we're talking about numbers as opposed to percentages. Right, 23 women had all three, and then another one uh, identified as lesbian or gay and also uh, expressed same-sex desire. Uh, but said that she had not engaged in same-sex behavior. And, you know, we have to say that there are a number of reasons why people uh, might have attractions or identities, but not necessarily act upon them in the sense of actually having sex with someone. Right. And now this, as you talk about the subsample here, this is a subsample drawn from this large population survey of all women who indicated any of the three, correct? This subsample consists of people who indicated any of those three involving same-sex desire, attraction, or behavior. All right, thank you. And, and let's turn to the diagram for men, if we could. Can you pull that, focus in on that? Thank you. Now, for men, you'll, if you look at these diagrams, you'll see that same-sex desire, behavior, and identity overlap for only 24% of the individual studies, correct? And here again, um, yeah, there were 34 men for whom they overlapped, uh, two men, additional men, who said that they identified as gay or lesbian, I'm sorry, as gay or bisexual, um, and who also had same-sex desire but not behavior. And then there are those three men who said that they uh, identified as gay or bisexual but had no desire or behavior with the same sex. And interestingly, uh, in a footnote in this chapter, Lauman and his colleagues explained that they actually believe that those three men made a mistake when they filled out the questionnaire uh, because they thought it was so anom such an anomalous result that they believed it was uh, a reflected error on the part of the respondents. And so here again, if you uh, accept the researcher's interpretation of the data, it would be the case that all of the men, uh, except those three, who identified as gay or bisexual also exhibited same-sex desire, and all but two of them uh, also had engaged in same-sex behavior. Well, let me ask you some questions about it. Do, you, do you agree that it would be impossible that those three people did not make a mistake, those 2%? I would 
not want to say that anything is impossible, but having done a great deal of survey research, um, I do know that people sometimes make mistakes when they're filling out questionnaires. All right. And we also see that 44% um, of the survey sample had desire, but n neither identity nor behavior. The 6% had desire and behavior, but not identity. The 22% had be same-sex behavior, but not same-sex desire or same-sex identity, correct? Correct. And, and none of those individuals overlapped with the identity category. So these were not individuals who identified as gay, lesbian, or bisexual. Correct. But they, they, they did engage in same-sex behavior and or have a same-sex desire depending on which group they fell, fell in, correct? Right. And I believe that the behavior uh, in this case was lifetime, or at least since age 18, any same-sex sexual behavior. And the desire was a question, again, as with the women, that included anyone who said that they were at least some, they found the idea of same-sex contact at least somewhat appealing. Uh, they would have been included in the desire category. Right. All right. Thank you. And let's, let's turn to page 300. And I, I don't need it anymore on the screen, just the text. It, the, the last paragraph on the page reads, this analysis demonstrates the high degree of variability in the way that differing elements of homosexuality are distributed in the population. This variability relates to the way that homosexuality is both organized as a set of behaviors and practices and experienced subjectively. It raises quite provocative questions about the definition of homosexuality. Do you disagree with any of those statements? Well, I think you have to keep reading. He says, while there is a core group, about 2.4% of the total men and about 1.3% of the total women in our survey, I'm sorry, while there is a core group, about 2.4% of the total men and about 1.3% of the total women in our survey who define themselves as homosexual or bisexual have same gender partners and express homosexual desires. There are also sizable groups who do not consider themselves to be either homosexual or bisexual, but have had adult homosexual experiences or express some degree of desire. Okay, it does say that. Do you disagree that uh, there's a high degree, that this analysis demonstrates a high degree of variability <coughs> in the way that differing elements of homosexuality are distributed in the population? Well, it, you know, I guess as I've already said, it shows that there are certainly this core group, there is this core group for whom the identity, the attraction, and the behavior are consistent. But there are also individuals who, for, who engage in same-sex behavior but don't experience attraction or identity. Also, individuals who say that they at least find the idea of same-sex sex, sex uh, somewhat appealing. So it, it does say that there are those, those sorts of individuals for whom these, these various dimensions don't overlap. All right, and then let's read at the end of the paragraph since we were reading on. The authors write, this preliminary, well, they, let's start with a sentence. They write where you ended. Okay. Uh, I can't remember where you ended, actually. Let's start. While, while the measurement of same gender practices and attitudes is crude at best, with unknown level of underreporting for each, this preliminary analysis provides unambiguous evidence that no single number can be used to provide an accurate and valid characterization of the incidence and prevalence of homosexuality in the population at large. In sum, homosexuality is fundamentally a multidimensional phenomenon that has manifold meanings and interpretations depending on context and purpose. Do you agree that homosexuality is fundamentally a multidimensional phenomenon that has manifold meanings and interpretations? Depending on context and purpose. All right. Um, yeah, and I think it's key that they're using the term homosexuality here because, as I've said, homosexuality can be understood in terms of attraction or behavior or identity. And I think what they're doing is affirming that statement uh, and pointing to their data to illustrate how, although it overlaps in many people, especially people who identify as lesbian, gay, or bisexual, that's not the case for everyone. All right. So do you agree that it's a multidimensional phenomenon? That's what I think I've been saying for the last few hours. All right, thank you.
All right. Please turn to page or tab 18 in the witness binder, if you would. You'll see a document. Actually, for some reason, this is not pre-marked, but it is the same document as PX 940. And uh, are you familiar with this uh, document? Can you identify this document, Professor Eric? Well, this is the title page to the book, Sexual Behavior in the Human Male, authored by Alfred Kinsey, Wardell Pomeroy, and Clyde Martin. Uh, I believe it was published in 1948. <coughs> All right, thank you. And Your Honor, I, I believe this is the the same material that was in PX 940, which was admitted into evidence this morning. And oh. now, and you relied on this document in, in your expert report in forming your opinions in this case, correct? Yes, on, well, at least on portions of it. Yes, thank you. It's a very massive document. Yes, it is. <laughs> Please turn to page 639, if you would, Professor Herrick. And around the middle of the page, you'll find what I gather is a pretty famous quote. And I'll read that. It's, males do not represent two discrete populations, heterosexual and homosexual. The world is not to, to be divided into sheep and goats. Not all things are black, nor all things white. It is a fundamental of taxonomy that nature rarely deals with discrete categories. Only the human mind invents categories and tries to force facts into separated pigeonholes. The living world is a continuum in each and every one of its aspects. The sooner we learn this concerning human sexual behavior, the sooner we shall reach a sound understanding of the realities of sex. And I, I believe you said earlier that you agree that sexual orientation ranges along a continuum, correct? Um, that, yes, that's how we generally understand it. And as I said, um, that idea was elaborated by Kinsey in this book. And if you look earlier on that page, on page 639, excuse me, but we're there already, but in the first paragraph, the one that's carry over from the last page, it says, but the record also shows that there is a considerable portion of the population whose members have combined within their individual histories both homosexual and heterosexual experience and or psychic responses. There are some whose heterosexual experience predominates. There are some whose homosexual experiences predominate. There are some who have had quite equal amounts of both types of experiences. And, and, and I, I, I gather you agree with that, correct? Well, the only thing I would... Uh, qualify is that Kinsey will be speaking here about the proportions of men in his sample. And, and this book was just about sexual behavior in men. Um, and we now know that Kinsey's sample uh, was certainly problematic in the sense that it, it couldn't be assumed to be representative of the population at large. Um, just because of the various techniques used. He was a very skilled researcher. He was amazing in getting people to be to talk about their own sexual experiences at a time when that was not commonly done. Um, so, uh, but the problem is that his sample, it, it's very difficult to generalize to the entire population because if you do, what you would say is that um, roughly half of all men um, either have homosexual experiences or desires. Uh, and, and that's quite inconsistent with data that we have uh, from other surveys. So I would just say that it's important to look at Kinsey as a source of numbers. He shows that there are large numbers of people with various patterns of experiences, but not to look at them in terms of proportions, which so, I think he was suggesting in this paragraph. So in other words, we should be cautious of precise numbers or proportions from Kinsey, correct? Well, you shouldn't generalize to the larger population, which is why I, when I talk about Kinsey, I tend to focus just on the number of people that he found manifesting this. We don't know to what extent that would translate into a, a population proportion that's generalizable. Right, but that, that doesn't go to his analysis or his constructs, correct? That goes to the numbers. Right, it goes to, it goes to the numbers. All right, and, and on page 638, if you turn back, there's a, Kinsey's uh, 
heterosexual homosexual rating scale and I, I'd like to pull this up on the screen too. Can we focus in on this on the graph and the and the numbers underneath a little a uh, little smaller so we get the numbers. Those are the two options. No, I want the number, the table of numbers underneath. Well, all right, we'll work with it at this level. All right. First of all, you see this graph that's uh, zero through six along the bottom, and then this this line, which I gather reflects his sampling. But now let's no. go. I'm sorry. That's not, I don't think that's what it reflects. Okay, it, it doesn't reflect his sampling. It just reflects the degree of heterosexuality or homosexuality for each metric, correct? I believe so. All right, thank you. I, I believe that correct, too. I apologize for that misstatement. Um, now, please go down, shift this down to the numbers underneath. And can you zoom in on the numbers from... Yes, thank you. So this is his scale. His scale. It's based on both psychologic reactions and overt experiences, individuals rate as follows. Zero, exclusively heterosexual with no homosexual. One, predominantly heterosexual, only incidentally homosexual. And, and they continue on through three, which is equally, and then gradually working up to six, which is exclusively homosexual, correct? Right. And, and do you believe this is a reasonable way to measure sex to measure sexual orientation? Well, Kinsey never wanted to measure sexual orientation. Um, Kinsey was out explicitly to uh, measure behavior and experience. Um, I I don't think you would find Kinsey uh, well as he said earlier he doesn't think the world can be divided into heterosexuals and homosexuals. And if you look at the study, you'll find that he never asked people whether they were heterosexual or gay or lesbian or bisexual. So this uh, scale has been used to define or to measure the uh, components of sexual orientation that we've been discussing in terms of attraction and behavior, but not in terms of identity. So that attraction and behavior are also definitions of sexual orientation that are used, correct? They are, they are yeah, components of sexual orientation, and that's what this has been used to measure. Correct. Thank you. Thank you. Now, please turn to tab 18A in the witness binder. It's You'll see an 18, and then after that you'll see an 18. Oh, I see. Okay. And you will see... Uh, a document pre-marked DIX 1272. And can you identify this document? Um, this is a paper that was published in 1977 in the Journal of Homosexuality titled Components of Sexual Identity by Michael Shively and John DeCecco. Thank you. And are you familiar with this document? Um, I am familiar with it, I have to say I haven't looked at it for a while, but I, I have looked at it in the past, yes. All right, thank you. Please turn to page 45 using the internal pagination. And under sexual orientation, in the, in the second paragraph under that heading, you'll see that he writes, quote, sexual orientation can be viewed as having two aspects. One is physical preference, and the other is affectional preference. Physical preference refers to the individual's preference for male and or female sexual partners. Affectional preference refers to an individual's preference for male and or female emotional partners. Correct. And then the, yeah, that's what it says. And then the author continues on. Physical preference can be viewed as two independent continua of heterosexuality and homosexuality. Uh, for, each, for each individual, there is one continuum for the physical heterosexuality and another for physical homosexuality. Qualitatively, individuals can be seen as heterosexual, homosexual, or both heterosexual and homosexual. 
quantitatively, individuals can be seen as having heterosexuality and homosexuality ranging from very much to very little. And, and he depicts this in uh, figure three, I believe. No. Or figure, figure four, excuse me, I apologize. Could you uh, zoom up on figure four? Correct? That's figure four. Yeah. yeah. And then he writes, continuing on in the next paragraph, uh, not, not after the figure, but after where we were reading, he writes, affectional preference in similar fashion can be viewed as two independent continua of affectional heterosexuality and affectional homosexuality. And then this is indicated in figure five on page 47, if we could zoom in on that. All right, and the reason Quine has two metrics each for physical and affectional preference is stated on page 46. And that is, he writes, that the bipolar view of sexual orientation is restricted to physical expression and suggests that homosexuality is expressed at the expense of heterosexuality or heterosexuality is expressed at the expense of homosexuality. And he rejects that bipolar view. So that's why he has these two separate continua each for physical and affectional heteros uh, homosexuality and heterosexuality. And, and let's put those together. I, I have a demonstrative that I'm going to put on the screen. And it, it just co combines these graphs together, figure four and figure five, so we can look at them. Can we uh, get that up so we see the whole thing? Not the figure, the... All right, I guess we don't have a demonstrative showing them both together. But in, en in essence, we end up with looking at figure four and figure five together, we end up having four graphs, essentially. We have, for physical preference, a scale of ranging from not at all heterosexual to very heterosexual with numbers from one to five from not at all homosexual to very homosexual with numbers from one to five. Then for affectional preference, we have the same thing. We have two graphs, one ranging from not at all heterosexual to very heterosexual, one ranging from not at all homosexual to very homosexual. Now, do you believe this is an unreasonable way to measure sexual orientation? Well, first of all, I got confused because you were saying Klein. I'm talking about Shively. Oh, okay. I, mis I misspoke. I apologize. This is Shively. We're talking Shively and Dechecko, Dechecko, correct? Okay. And, I, and I apologize for misspeaking there. Okay. Um, yeah, this actually was developed at a time when uh, psychology was beginning to look at gender uh, and, the t and the traits of masculinity and femininity um, in a new way, uh, whereas uh, masculinity and femininity had previously been conceptualized as lying at two ends of a bipolar continuum. You're either masculine or feminine, and if you're high on masculinity, you necessarily were low on femininity. Around this time, uh, some researchers had proposed that actually you could be, those were independent of each other. Some individuals were high on both masculinity and femininity, and, and those individuals were labeled androgynous. I believe that Shively and Dechecko were influenced by that uh, perspective, and what they proposed to do was to take Kinsey's uh, approach, which had that uh, scale that ranged from exclusively heterosexual to exclusively homosexual, and to apply this new way of thinking and say that um, you could possibly be high on both, uh, in which case I imagine you would be labeled bisexual, or you could be high on one, low on another, or low on both, in which case you would probably be labeled asexual. Uh, and I think that's a reasonable uh, way of asking about it. I, I think that one thing that's missing from uh, this approach is that they're looking at um, um, physical preference and uh, affectional preference. They're not asking about uh, a person's actual identification uh, or a person's behavioral history. But as far as looking at the idea of physical and affectional preferences, this is a reasonable way to measure that. Thank you. And, and so this would be a, a, an attraction-based 
theory of sex or definition of or measurement of sexual orientation, correct? I, I would say that that's where it focuses. All right, thank you. And now if you could, uh, well, Your Honor, I, I'd like to admit this uh, DIX 1272 into evidence. Hearing no objection, 1272 is admitted. All right, thank you. Now please turn back to tab 17 in your binder, if you would. And you'll see a, an, uh, an exhibit uh, document premark DIX 1265. Can you identify this document? Um, this is an article that was published in 1985 um, in the Journal of Homosexuality, and the title is Sexual Orientation, colon, A Multivariable Dynamic Process, and there are three authors, the first of whom is Fritz Klein. All right, thank you. And are you familiar with this document? Yes, I am familiar. I haven't read it recently, but I am familiar with the document. All right, thank you. And please look at page 35 on the first page, if you would, the first page of the article. And the authors, and I, I'm going to refer to Klein with the understanding that I'm referring to all of them, they, they write, quote, researchers have failed operationally or conceptually to define sexual orientation by not providing clear or consistent definitions. The study gives evidence that sexual orientation cannot be reduced to a bipolar or even tripolar process. But it must be, it says most, but I believe that's a typo and it means must, but it must be recognized within a dynamic and multivariate framework. Correct? That's what it says. Do you believe that any of those statements are unreasonable? Well. You know, they aren't unreasonable to have been writing it in 1985 in this paper. But you know what's happened is that since this paper came out and Klein introduced this, this uh, sexual orientation grid, researchers have done analysis with it that suggests that, um, al although they, they're very careful in separating out all of these different dimensions, um, most of those dimensions end up all clustering together when we do statistical analyses of them. So it turns out that although this Klein uh, sexual orientation grid separates out, many different components of sexual orientation and even social orientation, not simply things we would think of as sexual. The sexual components of it all seem to uh, boil down to one single underlying dimension in the way that people actually complete this grid. All right, well, well let's look at the grid a little bit if we could. Um, please look at page 39. And you'll you'll find that this grid lists several it lists several variables on the left. It's sexual attraction, sexual behavior, sexual fantasies, emotional preference, social preference, self-identification, and hetero gay lifestyle. Correct? That's that's it. And it uh, includes columns that say past, present, and ideal, correct? Correct. Now, if you look at page 41, you see a figure two. I'd like to get that up. And, and this, is, this is a matrix ranging from one to seven, ranging from other sex only to same sex only. And as you'll see from the discussion, the, the appropriate number is placed from this box is placed on the grid for each of the first five variables sexual attraction, sexual behavior, sexual fantasies, emotional preference, and social preference, correct? Yes. And then if you look on page uh, 42, you'll see figure 3. And this, again, has 1 to 7, ranging from hetero only to gay only. And the appropriate number is placed in each box on the grid for the last two variables, which are uh, self-identification and hetero gay lifestyle, correct? Uh, yeah, I believe so. Okay, and let, let's put this all together. I, I have a de demonstrative, I believe, if this one works, that combines the three together. Okay, apparently, apparently I, our 
we don't have the right set of demonstratives. But in, it, in short, we ha putting them together, you have this grid. Let, let's bring the grid up at least. And w using these two separate tables, you enter numbers into these 21 squares, correct? Yes. And now you, you said you don't believe, you believe this is, is or is not an unreasonable way to measure sexual orientation? Wh which was it? Well, it turns out that it's proved to be too burdensome because individuals are expected to provide 21 different ratings of their sexual orientation or some aspect at least somewhat related to it in this grid. And as I said, um, in subsequent research, um, the researchers have found that when they do statistical analyses to see how the data actually come out, you know, how people actually rate themselves, that on most of these variables, especially for the past and the present, um, on most of these variables, they all basically correlate very highly with each other, suggesting that underlying the grid, there is one unified conception of sexual orientation based on attraction, behavior, and identity. All right, and, and the authors wrote on page 38, yeah, right before sample characteristics, they write, in the present study, it was postulated that the individual sexual orientation is composed of sexual and non-sexual variables which differ over time. By studying a large group of individuals, this study validated the theoretical model of sexual orientation as multivariate and dynamic. I'm sorry, where are you reading? I'm, I'm it's, the last, it's the last uh, two sentences of the last paragraph before sample characteristics. Oh, okay. okay, I'm there. Okay, uh, I, if you could just quickly read those two sentences so I won't read them again. They say that this, their study validated the theoretical model of sexual orientation as multivariate and dynamic. Do you believe that they mischaracterized their results or their study? Well, I don't believe they mischaracterized their results. Um, it's just that, uh, you know, in, in subsequent studies where they have done factor analyses, uh, which is a particular statistical technique of responses to the Klein grid, um, those uh, those studies have shown that, as I said, there's there seems to be one core underlying dimension here. Um, uh, it, it's not to say that they were misrepresenting their data, but um, it just it's that you know whenever anyone proposes something or measure uh, or whatever, it, it is constantly subjected to subsequent empirical tests, and so the um, uh, subsequent empirical testing that I've seen of the Klein grid it has come up with that pattern, and I think that it's um, widely assumed by sexual orientation researchers or se sexuality researchers that um, depending upon what you're looking for, it might be useful to administer the Klein grid, but it's very burdensome to the respondent. It requires all of these questions to be answered, and it probably doesn't get you very far uh, or much further than by simply asking uh, simple questions about uh, attraction, behavior, and identity. So 21 boxes is too many, is that? Well, it's more than is necessary. All right, thank you. But now, well, okay, we'll, we'll move on from that. We, please turn to tab 19 in the witness binder. Well, at, first, Your Honor, I, I, would like, I would like to offer that exhibit, uh, DIX 1265, into evidence. There are no objection. 1265 is admitted. And when we get to a good place to break for luncheon, you might let me know. I, I would be happy to break at the court's pleasure. If now is a good time, I, we can break now. I don't want to interrupt your examination. Uh, it's, it's, it's as good a time as any. Thank you. All right, then why don't we uh, resume then, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Let's come back at, uh, see if we can come back at 20 minutes after 1 o'clock. Is that all right? Thank you very much, Your Honor.